Let us pray. Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, and yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ, whose compassion illumines the world. And so we pray this morning that you would transform each of us into the likeness and the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> There's something about a mountain. On top of a mountain, you're above everything else. Could it be that the air is thinner up there? top of a mountain, there's great majesty. We just heard a wonderful story that took place on the top of a mountain. Peter, James, and John have had an incredible moment with Jesus on a mountaintop in Galilee. But they can't stay up there. They can't contain that experience, that mysterious moment they had. They must leave that glory on the mountaintop and go down to the valley below. And little do they know, as they walk down that mountain, that they are beginning the journey with Jesus to the cross. This mysterious story that John read so well for us from Matthew's Gospel takes place on mountaintop. Think about all the stories of the Bible that take place on mountains. It always seems to be something important. I've heard it said that mountaintops are the place where humans can get closest to God and touch the divine. And sure enough, this experience takes place on a mountain. Jesus takes three disciples, James, John, and Peter, with him on this, let's call it a camping trip. We don't know why they've gone up there. <coughs> no idea were, they, were the other disciples busy fishing or something that they couldn't go. Or maybe Jesus chose these three because he wanted to have an intimate conversation with them, a, a time set apart to pray. Whatever the reason, I'm sure they found it more than they ever bargained for on that mountaintop that day. But Jesus invited and they followed. And as they're up there, Jesus is transfigured. That's a big word, transfigured. Now, the kids might tell us that they know all about transformers, <laughs> but transfiguration is a, it's a tough thing to kind of swallow. And so I like to say Jesus was changed or Jesus was illumined. Moses and Elijah are up there as well, but then they strangely disappear. And Peter, the disciple seems to be perplexed. James and John, they don't say a word and they might as well be anonymous. God quotes God's self. The disciples are overcome with awe. They fall to the ground, fearful of what is happening around them. Jesus says, don't be afraid. And then at the end, he tells them to tell no one about what they have seen or experienced on this mountaintop. Mystery and intrigue rule the moment. Jesus' face shone like the sun. His clothes became dazzling white. Again, whatever these three disciples expected to do with Jesus on this camping trip, he's changed right before their eyes. He became holy on that mountaintop. But it's not easy to explain. It's almost easier to talk about Jesus doing a miracle like opening the eyes of a blind man so that the blind man 
may see or raising Lazarus from the dead makes more sense than trying to explain the transfiguration. This dazzling display of holiness seems more fit for a superhero movie or a sci-fi book. Peter, our hero, boldly responds to this mystery unfolding in front of him, and he takes some initiative and says, Jesus, it's good for us to be here. And then he says, how about I build some tents? And Peter's desire to capture and contain this spectacular moment is reminiscent of the Old Testament, the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was that gold-plated wooden box that in Jewish and Christian tradition, that God lived in that box. The Ten Commandments were on two tablets that were stored in that box. And so Peter does what most of us would want and try to capture that moment. But God speaks directly from a cloud and tells Peter, this is my son, my beloved. With him I'm well pleased, listen to him. If it couldn't get more strange, what happens on this mountaintop is again a mystery. But Peter is again acting like what we human beings do when we experience something we can't explain and it blows us away. Hey, let's build a museum. Let's build a tourist attraction. We can sell tickets and we can show off our God and we can make money. But before Peter can draw up his plans, he is humbled by God. As God basically says, Peter, I will not be kept in a box anymore. In this inexplicable moment on this mountaintop, everything changes. Even though the disciples don't get the big picture, oh, they were blown away by the light show, they were overwhelmed by the sights and the sounds, but they don't understand what's happening. I imagine we don't either. Unaware about once this transfiguration happens, that we've got to go down that mountain and join Jesus on a journey that he told us about in chapter 16, but we really don't want to hear. So maybe what happens on this mountain is we better understand God? I don't know. But what happens on this mountaintop, I think, is a celebration. A celebration of God and God's love. Of God and God's love that cannot be contained in a box anymore. Of God and love that's expansive, that it, when we encounter that love, it expands us as well. And so throughout all scripture, we are reminded that God and God's love is the power behind creation. It's also the grace that gives us salvation. And so the God we find on this mountaintop is no longer the God of a box. No longer a linear, transactional God, but the God who is transfigured in front of these three mystified disciples is expansive and ever-expanding, more than they could ever dream of. You see, if God can't be contained in the box, then nothing can ever contain God. And God's love because on that mountaintop, God broke loose. And nothing in all of creation could contain God and God's love expressed through Jesus Christ. You see, a tent couldn't hold God, a box couldn't hold God, an ark couldn't hold God, a mountaintop couldn't hold God, the valley below couldn't hold God, not a garden, not a jail cell, not a cross, and certainly not a tomb. You see, the mystery of that mountaintop 
brings together the old and the new. Uniting the past, the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, the New Testament, the disciples and Jesus, together on a mountaintop, a moment that is a sign for the disciples to move forward. To go down off the mountain and begin the work, the work of Jesus and his ministry, the work of the church. And that's where we come in. You know what it's like to have a holy moment, a mountaintop experience. You wish you could put it in a jar and save it for those days that are tough. Those days you go down the mountain into the valley. And here we are, the struggles of our world. Another week, the war continues in Ukraine with no end in sight. Another week, and senseless mass shootings. Michigan State, Baltimore, Maryland, Buffalo, New York, Columbus, Georgia, Coldwater, Mississippi, El Paso, Texas, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Patterson, New Jersey, and that was this week alone. Earthquakes with the death toll in Syria and Turkey, well over 40,000 people dead. Chemical spills from train derailments not far from where we are today. And the water, oh my goodness, the water. What about the water that's still not fit to drink in Flint, Michigan? Suffering, violence, death. I'm training to be a chaplain for the Cincinnati Police Department and the Hamilton County Sheriff's Department. It's a rigorous process of background checks and all sorts of paperwork, and then going to class. And on Friday, the trainer shared some staggering statistics about the number of police officers who are dying by suicide. 2021, there were 632 law enforcement deaths across our nation. That is 632. Over 25% of those were self-inflicted deaths. And the rate is going higher. The men and women who work to serve and protect us are in despair. Yesterday I went to a presbytery meeting thinking, oh, I'll take my mind off of some of this stuff going on in the world. And lo and behold, in the midst of church business, they had a panel discussion about building trust among races. Caucasian, African Americans, Asian Americans, white, black, brown, what have you. The panel went on to say, Did you know, we're actually probably more fragmented today than ever before. Because in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, you could see it. It was right there, white hoods and burning crosses, whites only signs and colors to the back of the bus. But now it's subtle. It's systemic, it's written into the laws. So to break the bonds of racism, it's oh so much more difficult. I know, I can see it on your faces. Please preacher, no more bad news, stop. I will. But I want you to know the reality that when you come down the mountain, it's dark. The shine is off the moment. And if you don't understand the simple truth that nothing can separate you from the love of God, then it'll be even darker. So that's why I read the story to the children. And I really read loud so you'd hear it too. <clears throat> But I'll repeat some of it. Can anything separate us from God's love? Not a mountain or a valley, not the deepest of seas, not a rainstorm or a hailstorm, not a cold winter freeze, not a rumbling volcano, not an earthquake or a flood, not a swirling tornado or a sinkhole of mud. 
For there's nothing so powerful, nothing so strong as God's love. God's love is too high, too deep, and too long. No, God's love doesn't change with the words that you say or the things that you do. God's love will not go away. For you are loved and forgiven. What a wonderful thing. You are adopted as God's own. You are a child of God the king. See, nothing can separate you from God's love. Nothing on earth or below or above. So friends, as we find ourselves in the valleys of life, no matter how dark they may be, remember this mysterious story of a mountaintop, a transfiguration, where God and God's love was let loose, and nothing can separate us from God and God's love. Amen. Amen.